This happened many, many years ago. But I, I went to worship at one of the evening services at the Tyler campus. I didn't have any responsibilities that night to preach or do liturgy, so I was just going to sit in the pew like you do. And since I didn't have any pastor responsibilities, I, I didn't wear this collared shirt with the clergy tab. I was just in my work clothes, which was business casual, no tie. Well, almost immediately entering uh, the Tyler campus, I got this look and a hand gesture. And it went something like this. Made it very clear that this person knew I didn't have a tie on and it was completely unacceptable that I had thought of even entering without one. Now, I know this is just the opinion of one person. Okay, I, I get that. And yet, the message was loud and clear of who's in and who is out. Who is acceptable and who is not. Right or wrong, message received. Well, as I mentioned, this Sunday is Confirmation Sunday tomorrow. And in which, you know, don't worry, we're going to have the kids dress up. Okay. And we're going to put into their hands the right things to say. And after they've said the right things, then we are going to say to them, You're in! You're one of us! Congratulations! And if they don't say those words, I'm sorry, you're not in. You're not yet. It's interesting how in very small ways, just one person to another with one of these... To big moments like confirmation that we are constantly updating each other's status. You're in or you're out. Now, as we then move to this second week of our deep and wide sermon series, we're going to be looking at that very question. Well, well, who does get to be in and who decides who is out. And we're not going to concern ourselves with trivial matters of how one is dressed. We're going to go to the basic fundamental questions of, well, who is this place for in the first place? What does it mean to confirm your, your faith into what? What organization? The church? I mean, because we learned last week that the church is not something you go to. It's not a ministry or institution. You are the dwelling place. You're, you are the church. You are the fellow followers of Jesus, having been gathered by him to now live out everything he has said as we love God with all of our heart and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So that's what, you know, this is all about. And I thought it would be kind of fun then to have this be the final exam for the confirmands tomorrow. I'll just try it out today. Because if this really, if this really is then our question, well, well, who is this for? Because this is what the church is. It's the dwelling place of the followers of Jesus. Then who is it for? One question, pass or fail. Choose A or B. Okay, now I'm not going to have you raise your hands. We're not going to embarrass anyone. But just in your mind, pick one right now. Because I'm going to give you the right answer. Okay, so okay, you got yours? Who is the, the, the congregation for? It's for, <gasps> drum roll, them. What? Yeah, it's the, it's the mission of Jesus. That's why he came to seek and to save them, the lost, the outsider. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son into death that we might not perish, but that we might have eternal life. And, and okay, so that's the right answer, but it, it kind of furrows the brow a bit, right? It's like, well, what about us? Don't we count? I mean, we showed up today, and, and, we'll, and, and so we, we'd like to modify the answer, please. We'd like to be a little more inclusive that the congregation isn't just for them. It's for, yes, it's for us too. It's for both. And that makes us happy. It's like, yeah, okay, now this is making sense to me too. But what I'd like to do is check this answer with reality. 
It's very simple to do. What I want you to think in your mind is that any service, any gathering that we've had in the past at Ascension, either campus, who shows up? Is it us or is it them? Is it most of the time it's, it's us, right? That's mainly who comes to this gathering. It's, it's us. So any guesses who we cater to the interests and the appeal, right? Any guesses who the, the worship service is really meant to retain and bring back? Any guesses who the sermons are meant to really, you know, speak to? Yeah, um, yeah, okay, now we've got the answer, right? This gathering is really about us, and it's for us. You know, the door's open, though, and anybody could come in, and we welcome all comers, right? You know, and they can come, and they can be with us and learn how we do things, and then they'll learn to love it as much as we do. Right? I mean, that's very, very, you know, benevolent of us to do such this for, for them, right? And, 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 you know, I'm just going to be really honest with you. That is the ministry model of our congregation, is that we're going to do this for us, and then anyone can come, and we hope that they do. We're praying that they do. And when they do, they can join us in being us, because it's for us. All right, so at least we're all on the same page. Um, oh, but wait a minute. This sermon series is about challenge. Remember last week I said it's about repentance, and repentance by its very nature is threatening because it calls us to die to what we are doing to a new life of faith with Jesus. And the closer we get to what's really important to us, like this is for us, the more threatening it becomes. Well, what do you mean? What, what are you going to change? Because we kind of like what we're doing. See, as we get really close to looking at this, we, we, we begin to get very defensive. Like, what we do here is good. In fact, I even said it was good last week, remember? It's like, we do worship well. And, and, and you think about everything we do, it's Christ-centered, it's biblical, it's true, it's right, it's good. And so, there's really not much we need to fix here. And I will agree with you that all of that is true. We are all of that and more. But is it possible? Is it the remote possibility that you could be right and orthodox and Christ-centered and biblical and still be wrong? Is that possible? Well, let's just, again, play it out in reality and, and what happened, at least in the reality that Jesus experienced at a party. Let's ask Simon, because he was a guy who was right, and he was Christ-centered. He invited Jesus to his house, right, to the party. And when Jesus got there, Jesus himself agreed that, Simon, you are someone who just sins a little bit. Which meant the rest of his life, his personal life was in good order, his religious life, his family life, his community life, it was all being done right. But I don't want you to look at what Simon was doing right. I don't even want you to look at what the little bit he was doing wrong. What I want you to look at is who got to touch Jesus at that party. Whose worship at that party of Jesus was acceptable? Whose heart was in the right place and whose wasn't? Whose offering was applauded by Jesus and who was admonished? Was it the good and right man Simon who sinned just a little bit? Or was it the woman? See, who did Jesus say was in and who did he say was out? 
Now, before you answer that, keep in mind that Simon had every opportunity to be someone who touched Jesus. As soon as he came into his house, the, the local custom of that day was to greet one another with a kiss on the cheek. Simon could have been the one to pour oil on the head of Jesus, showing every guest and visitor to his house that this is a man of high dignity, of high worth, almost someone you could call a king as we anoint him with oil. Simon could have put himself in the place of washing the feet of Jesus. Now, each one of these touchings of Jesus, it, it's very intimate and close quarters, and you need the permission of the person that you're touching to do that kind of touching. And Jesus had given him all of that permission and more. In fact, Jesus was a bit shocked that none of that had happened. It's like, you didn't do any of this for me. Jesus did not say to Simon, you're out. Simon excluded himself. Simon didn't touch Jesus because he didn't want to. He kept him at a guarded distance. That, he, that way he might evaluate what Jesus had to say and his manner of what he did. And thank heaven he did. I mean, good. Because look what Jesus did. If he were really a prophet, he would know what kind of wo woman was touching him, right? And that she was a sinner. But he didn't. He didn't have a clue. And so when you look then into the heart of Simon, you find that there was no devotion for Jesus, no great love, no admiration, no trust. In fact, there, there was nothing there that said, my life hangs in the balance, Jesus, of what you think about me and what you say about me. Because Simon was already in, so he thought, with God. But that's how we humans do things. We are the ones who decide who's in and who's out. But there's only one voice that gets to do that. There's only one person in the entire universe who gets to say who's in and who's out with God. And that person was at the party now, we do need to clear the record about Jesus, and at least so we all know that he knew exactly who was touching him and what kind of woman she was. He knew what prompted those tears that drenched his feet. He knew what she had to do to earn the money for that expensive perfume. He knew her very sad story of childhood that we do not he knew her adult story and the excuses that she has now given of why she does what she does. Jesus knows her through and through, and he did not push her away. See, now we have the answer of who's in. And the answer is, whosoever will. Who? Whoever will. That could have been Simon. Simon. But his heart was nothing like the heart of this woman. And Jesus would explain why his heart wasn't like the woman's. Jesus said, well, whoever has been forgiven little only loves a little. But who's ever been forgiven much loves much. And it's, it's messy what Jesus did. He accepted her said she was in as is, and then just willy-nilly forgives all of her sins as if it were no big deal. That's messy because what if this woman goes home and really is, goes back to the same life that she always had? What if that woman has this one area in her life forgiven, her, her sexual life, it's all changed and forgiven, but what if the rest of it's just a mess? What if she uses this one encounter with Jesus to validate her entire life, thinking, well, God must not care how I live. Sins are no big deal to him. It's messy, right? All of that could have happened. And you, I think it's pretty safe to assume to some degree, big or small, that it did happen. And the reason I can be so certain without ever having met her is that I, I know myself. 
I know how messy my own life is and I hear Jesus say day after day, you are forgiven. I love you. I dwell within you. It's messy. And yet, Jesus says, whosoever. Well, that really bothered Simon and his guests. Just to see how amazing God's grace is and how big and deep and wide his love is. But Jesus, it really, his really is the only voice that matters. And, and he sounds the caution bell to anyone who thinks that they only sin a little, that they really have their life in good order and that they are in with God simply because of that. He, he calls to repentance every heart that would think that because you may find yourself not in but out. His voice is the one who makes that determination. Our lives then hang in the balance of what he says and do not be worried or concerned that he says also to you, whosoever will, I will receive. And I forgive your sins. And it's not willy-nilly. It was at a great cost. And it's messy. But you know, God's okay with the mess. He really is. And you know why we can know for sure that he's okay with the mess? And, and the vicar, he, he, he said it a couple weeks ago. He said, that, remember this line, that, that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive to God. That has to be the message of this place. That whosoever will is welcome at our Jesus party. That whosoever the mess can receive his forgiveness. Whosoever he will lead into a life that is like his own of holiness and goodness and rightness. But he doesn't do it all at once. It just doesn't happen that way. And so the church has to be for them. Because the truth is, we are them. And so as we live out as we turn in repentance, as we really do change how we minister and, and do our ministry here, in very small ways from this to, oh, you're making noise over there. Oh, you know what her life is like, right? We are all them. To help us, then, the sermon take-home is Philippians 2, 1 to 4. And then a prayer and the prayer is, Jesus, may we be a gathering for others, trusting that you will take care of us. May the Lord bless us and keep us in his kind care. Amen.